Hi, everybody. It's so great to see everyone on this crisp and sunny day. And the snow is melted, but it's quite beautiful out my window anyway. Um, welcome today. I'm Sharon Levine. I'm the section head for geriatrics here at um, MGH. And we are really excited to see so many of you here to explore today's topic. And um, you'll be meeting doctors um, Sean and Monique Hedman, who will be talking about medical cannabis. And I am going to pass along the baton to Judy Willett. I mean, to uh, Susan Edge, no, to Judy, right? To yeah. Judy, um, who's going to um, get you started in today's, uh, for today's session. And we're so glad you're here. Always wonderful to see you. And this is an important topic. We get asked about this a lot. Um, Dr. Russell is away this um, this week, and so um, I'm pinch hitting for him, and um, it's great to see you all. Thank you, Sharon. That's great. Welcome again, everyone. Um, I just wanted to let you know that a few months ago, we held a town hall focus group. We wanted to get your input and your thoughts and comments on how the town halls have affected you, what you liked, what you were looking forward to, all those kinds of things. And just as a very high level, I just wanted to let you know that the people who attended that said that all of our town halls, which again, we started when COVID hit, so a few years ago now, found the town halls informative, very interesting. They really liked now that COVID is on a lower rise and at a different stage, they really like the very to varied topics and it really improved the feelings of community. So we were very pleased to hear all of that. We also had suggestions to maybe have some breakout sessions so that there was even more ability for more people to have discussions. So that's something depending on the topic that we can absolutely think about. Also, people gave us feedback on topic ideas, and some of them range from resources for caregivers to what's the difference between palliative care versus hospice, and also just MGB, and what's the structure and the effect, and what does it feel like and look like for patients along with providers at MGH and other places. So those are just some of the highlights and now we can get onto our fascinating topic today. Susan? All right, thank you, Judy. Um, I wanna add my welcome to everyone. We're excited that we have so many people participating today. So before we get started, I need to go over some of the housekeeping rules. So first of all, we have everyone muted so that we eliminate any background noise. And um, so, so that's important for everyone to understand. Um, if you want to view the speaker on your full screen, go to the gallery view up in the upper right-hand corner and you can click on speaker full screen or you can click on participants, which is the view that I'm in right now so that you see everybody who's on the call. If your picture becomes jumpy or gets out of sync, um, turn your camera off because that might speed up your connection. And to do that, you need to go to the lower left-hand corner and click on stop video over the little video camera. For questions, please use the chat feature, which is right in the middle of the ribbon across the bottom of your screen. And you can go in and enter any questions you might want us to um, pose to our speakers today when they finish their formal presentation. So I just want um, to take a minute. We're going to be hearing from Drs. Monique um, Hedman and Dr. Sean Hedman. Um, we are very lucky to have them with us today. Um, Dr. Monique Hedman is a geriatric medicine fellow in our geriatric medicine practice. So she um, is practicing with Dr. Levine and Dr. Russell, um, who you all know well. Um, Dr. Hedman received her BA in psychology from Emory University and her MPH from Columbia University in New York City. 
prior to attending medical school at Oregon Health and Sciences University in Portland, she worked at Columbia um, Medical Columbia University Medical Center and Harlem Hospital Center, where she developed several public health initiatives for older adults, children, and families. She's a founding board member of Arts and Minds and an advisory member and contributing artist for Hip Hop Public Health. Um, she completed her residency in family medicine at Harbor UCLA Medical Center and she re she also served as the regional vice president there for the committees of interns and residents. She is interested in addressing health disparities, exploring cultural influences, and championing the tenets of optimal aging and trauma-informed care in older adult communities. Dr. Sean Hedman, who happens to be her father, um, graduated from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine internal medicine residency and Baylor College of Medicine cardiology fellowship and, and Brown University. He practiced cardiology with Kaiser Permanente for 25 years in Portland, Oregon. And after retirement, he was drawn to the field of medical cannabis by the distinct benefits reported by family and friends for their various ailments. And he's been involved in this field for the past 12 years. He's a member of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians and attends many of their educational conferences and webinars to keep up with the ever-expanding findings and scientific studies that help define and understand the role of medical cannabis for its treatment for a wide range of conditions. He's often in awe, and I'm sure you'll hear this today, of the improvements noted by patients and, and their families in their quality of life that they share with him frequently. So with that, we're going to begin our presentation, and I think we're starting with Dr. Uh, Monique Hedman. Thank you all very much. I'm going to just share my screen here. Okay, again, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Very happy to be with you all today. I'd like to start this talk uh, with a brief anecdote uh, from my past. When I was in college, I had an amazing professor named Dr. Diane Stewart, uh, who is uh, from the Caribbean and is now a tenured professor in religion at my alma mater, uh, Emory University. I recall chatting with her uh, outside of class one day about the use of cannabis among her students. Uh, she had just had to help one of her students get out of legal jeopardy uh, because of a possession issue. And as she was talking about it, she said, you know, weed is for old people. And that always stuck out in my mind and I never forgot it. Uh, so it's amazing that I'm here almost 20 years later speaking on that very subject. Um, it's an honor to be doing this with my father, uh, who has supported and encouraged me throughout my journey to become a doctor and has helped thousands of patients over the course of his own career. So I want to thank him and everyone here on the call that made this talk possible. So I'll open with a brief history of medical cannabis. Uh, it's been used for thousands of years, uh, both here in the Americas and around the world. Uh, here in the United States, cannabis or hemp was cultivated to make rope, clothing, and other textiles. Uh, there was actually a law in 1619 that required every farmer to grow hemp. Uh, in the 1830s, an Irish doctor named Sir William Brooke O'Shaughnessy discovered that cannabis extract could help decrease vomiting and stomach pain in people suffering from cholera. So by the late 1800s, cannabis extract was sold throughout the United States and, and Europe to treat a variety of conditions. There were over 100 articles published uh, in Europe and, and the Americas noting the benefits of cannabis at this time, and it was part of the, the US pharmacopoeia. So around the turn of the century, uh, there was a lot of political upheaval in Mexico uh, that led to the Mexican Revolution of 1910, which also led to a wave of Mexican immigration to the United States. Uh, there was a lot of fear around this influx of immigrants and the use of cannabis or marijuana uh, by these newcomers was used as a flashpoint for this xenophobia. A fun fact is that uh, the basis of the Spanish word marijuana uh, is based on Maria Iwana, which was the slang term for Rockwell. So with this background of uh, anti-immigrant sentiment, 
fueled by the Great Depression, as well as prohibition efforts, cannabis was deemed the evil weed uh, that was used by degenerates and produced satanic jazz and swing music and led to fornication between the races and thereby needed to be outlawed. Uh, so cannabis was removed from the pharmacopoeia and was outlawed in 29 states by 1931. Uh, the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act effectively criminalized cannabis throughout the U.S., but it was still kind of tolerated as long as it wasn't really out in the open. Things really changed uh, with the Controlled Substance Act of 1970 that was signed by President Nixon, which made cannabis a Schedule I drug. Uh, not only did this hamper our ability to study it, but it led to the disproportionate incarceration of black and brown people in the United States, despite relatively equal levels of use among various racial and ethnic groups. Uh, there are still hundreds of thousands of arrests for cannabis possession happening annually all over the country, and most of them are for low-level possession and disproportionately affect minorities. Uh, some of these laws are beginning to change, and hopefully we can continue to put an end to this ingest injustice in the years to come. Uh, but for all of these reasons, we are moving away from the term marijuana because of its inherently racist and xenophobic roots in this country, and are encouraging people to embrace the more neutral term cannabis. Dad? And it should be useful to note that over the years, there have been multiple agencies and groups that have called for removal of cannabis from Schedule One, including the FDA, the American Medical Association, A AARP. Uh, they're all recognizing that there's no need for it to be on Schedule One uh, anymore. And however, this has been consistently declined by the DEA, uh, perhaps mostly for political reasons and also possible for financial implications that it could have for pharmaceutical companies. This, so hence, the, we do not have as much information, uh, evidence-based information that we could use. There still remains a stigma for its use. Fortunately, a lot of very good studies have come out from uh, information uh, from studies that were done in Europe and in Israel. And so we have a fairly good amount of information now about medical cannabis. Dr. Hedman, could I just ask you to speak up a little? Oh, okay. I Okay, very good. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I'm quite soft-spoken, and I definitely get it from my dad. So we'll both, uh, we'll both give no, you, you were fine, but I think, Dr. Hedman, if, if you could just speak up a little bit. Okay, will do. Thank you. So in recent years, people have started to recognize the benefits of medical ca uh, cannabis, and it's starting to permeate the general American consciousness. So in 2015, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who's a well-known medical commentator from CNN, led the first of several episodes in the Weed documentary series exploring this topic of medical cannabis. The latest episode, number seven, that just came out late last year is entitled A Senior Moment, uh, where he talks about the potential benefits of cannabis use as we age. This article was published in the New York Times a couple of months ago, detailing how older adults are beginning to turn to medical cannabis to treat the common ailments that affect them, and many of them are finding it helpful and preferable to many pill-based therapies. People over the age of 65 are the fastest growing group of cannabis users in the United States. Many of these folks uh, came of age during the so-called war on drugs and are now open to the idea that cannabis could help them with some of the health challenges that often accompany the aging process. Yeah? Yes. Okay, so... Uh, the medical benefits um, for cannabis uh, are include the use of the uh, can, uh, or we, sorry we're up to this of cannabis medicine. So we understand that part of what we now understand is, is medical cannabis works by using through the endocannabinoid system, and that includes uh, the use of the identification of of two uh, two systems two uh, two chemicals that have been made by the body uh one of them is called uh, anantamide the other one is uh, 2AG uh these uh, endocannabinoids bind to the identified receptors of CB1 of which includes uh, it, which seems to be found mostly in brain tissue uh, as well as in nerve tissue. 
And then CB2, which seems to be more widely distributed throughout the organs of the body, and in particular in the immune system. Uh, these uh, tend to go and help regulate. We uh, sort of create a general homeostasis in the body. It regulates appetite, helps promote sleep. Uh, it also works with the, in, in the immune system, modulates pain symptoms. Um, and uh, generally it is part of all that seems to help us uh, function in the world. I will say that there's been this concept of being an endocannabinoid tone. That is that the whole mixture of uh, circulating endocannabinoids, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, re the distribution of the receptors, as well as even the enzymes that break down the endocannabinoids contribute to this tone. Uh, and part as that has been evolved, it has been this whole concept of endocannabinoid dysfunction as well, or deficiency. And it's been noted that it seems that alterations in some of the concentrations seem to be uh, contribute uh, to significant significantly to some of the medical disorders. It was noted uh, in people with chronic migraine uh, that people that there were lower levels of an entomide noted in the cerebral spinal fluid. In addition, there's also been alterations in the uh, endocannabinoid system noted in many people with uh, PTSD. Uh, they tend to promote the ways to go and help improve that whole endocannabinoid tone is by getting, well, uh, getting good sleep, uh, good nutrition, uh, remaining active, uh, all of which seems to allow cannabis to help impart that benefits to many people. Uh, I, I also say that I, at a conference, I, it was noted that of all the things that seemed to help, uh, singing was one of those. And I, I've always belonged in a singing group and always felt good after you know rehearsal, but they actually took some volunteers, measured their endocannabinoid levels before rehearsal and afterwards, and not too, too surprising, uh, the, their levels were elevated from 30 to 70% from baseline. So I just like to add that, um, you know, the feeling of euphoria that people often have with osteopathic manipulation or even from acupuncture and even the so-called runner's high uh, that people get after vigorous, vigorous aerobic exercise is attributable to the release of endogenous cannabinoids or endocannabinoids in the system. So for patients that do not respond well to standard therapies, uh, but see their symptoms improve significantly with the use of cannabinoids, it's likely because the phytocannabinoids are correcting the imbalance of endogenous cannabinoids in the body. So let's talk about these phytocannabinoids. Uh, so there's two types of cannabis plants. There is cannabis sativa, which tends to be more activating, and cannabis indica, which is more sedating. Uh, THC, or delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, is the most studied of the phytocannabinoids. Um, CBD, or cannabidiol, is an isomer of THC that does not have any psychoactive activity. Uh, CBN is, or cannabinol is a product of THC metabolism and is thought of as a weaker version of THC. And CBG is referred to as the mother because it is the precursor uh, for all the other cannabinoids. Uh, THC and to a lesser degree CBN have been associated with uh, relief of pain, inflammation, spasticity, nausea, anxiety, puritis and seizures, and also helps to stimulate appetite. CBD uh, has been shown to increase circulating endogenous cannabinoids or endocannabinoids, and also has activity at serotonin and capsaicin receptors. Uh, it's also been associated with relief of pain, anxiety, depression, seizures, inflammation, spasticity, and nausea, but there's also some emerging evidence that it may have value as an antipsychotic. In addition uh, to the conditions that I just mentioned that have been associated with uh, effective treatment with THC and CBD, uh, CBG has been shown to reduce erythema or uh, skin inflammation and actually inhibits certain inflammatory enzymes um, more potently than THC does. This is Dr. a good- Dr. Hedman? Yes. Can I just ask a question? Can you just quickly 
review the differences that you just talked about just to make sure that everybody understands them. Okay. So, uh, so THC is the most well-known phytocannabinoid, the most well-studied, and it tends to be psychoactive. CBD um, is an isomer of THC. So it's similar, but molecularly, but different. And does, it is not psychoactive. Um, CBG is like a starter molecule or a precursor uh, to the other cannabinoids that we're talking about. And CBN is just like, it's like a small part of the THC molecule. It's just like a fraction of the THC molecule and has okay. similar effects as THC, but uh, it has a weaker effect. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. That's um, okay. So this is a good time to introduce the concept of the entourage effect, uh, which basically suggests that cannabinoids work together to enhance each other's benefits and decrease side effects. So for example, CBD antagonizes potential undesirable effects of THC, such as intoxication or sedation or even tachycardia, uh, while also enhancing its analgesic and antiemetic effects. Dan? Okay. And I will say there's been an emer emerging uh, aspect of the uh, of, of cannabis where they note that there are terpenes uh, that are part of the multiple, multiple compounds in the plant seem to also offer their own uh, effect on the entourage. Uh, the, the terpenes are are what get, are found in many flowers and fruits, uh, et cetera, and seem to give cannabis this very distinct uh, aroma. Um, it tends to modulate the effects of THC, and it's the different properties of the terpenes that probably tend to give the strains their different uh, effects. Some people will note that some strains are more uh, euphoric or uplifting, others are more sedative and calming. And it's generally thought that it's the combination and mixture of the terpenes in any given strain that introduces these different effects. All right. So many, many different ways that uh, can be introduced for any given patient to get uh, the benefits from medical cannabis. The most uh, seemingly the most uh, popular uh, at some point uh, includes the inhalation methods. Uh, there are people who do, you know, smoke uh, cigarettes or joints. Uh, <laughs> they will oftentimes say I'm pretty much old school. Uh, there's the people who evolved to using uh, vapor pens, uh, which uh, have uh, cannabis-induced oil that are introduced, and people will also use what we call uh, ta tabletop vaporizers, where they'll actually uh, vaporize a flower and, uh, and get benefits from there. And there are some products out there that are actually portable vaporizers that do vaporize uh, uh, flower, uh, flower material. Uh, but I will say that most of the time, uh, patients uh, patients will try to use various forms of uh, edibles, and there used to be combinations of c candies, uh, uh, brownies, cookies. Uh, on the downside, they seem to be highly variable about who it was, where it was made, and how it was. So some people would sometimes get a, you know a cookie one time and get no effect. The uh, same cookie bought and, or made another time gets too much of an effect. Uh, gummies that are now part of the major use seem to be a really nice uh, way they can, they've been able to match uh, and get combinations or of the different forms of the phytocannabinoids uh, and then patients can, and different concentrations. So patients can actually kind of use what seems to work uh, for them and then adjust accordingly. And as we always tend to advise them, uh, you start slow and then uh, to see how the effect goes and then uh, increase, uh, I'm sorry, start low and then increase slowly to till you match or get to a point where you get the benefits and not having any adverse side effects. Uh, tinctures are also another way that people will use to um, get use cannabis. Uh, sometimes they will just put it into a liquid, uh, soda, uh, or what have you. Um, oftentimes, though, they'll use the tincture directly into their mouth and get what we call oral mucosal absorption. 
And another method is the use of the of topical forms, topical forms and transdermal. I, I've I've never been enthused for people to spend the extra money to get transdermal uh, cannabis, but some people swear by it. Uh, but mostly the topicals tend to be made from uh, some uh, type of a coconut oil uh, that's been infused with cannabis and it's just applied to the affected area. I have many people that certainly use topicals as an adjunct to whatever they may inhale or ingest. Uh, but I've actually had some people act, you know, just patients just use their well, a well-made topical alone. Another form is the is is oral mucosal sprays. Um, there, there's one that's used in Europe and Canada called Sativex, and it's been extensively studied, but it's not allowed uh, in the United States. Um, but I have seen methods, other I guess more local uh, people, local 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 people sometimes create a spray. Um, and if you find one, you'd have to read the label to see just how much is in, how much cannabis is in there to see if it will be uh, effective for you. So cannabis and pain, this seems to be the, uh, the, the main thing that's being used. AARP certainly noted that chronic pain, anxiety, Depression and sleep uh, disturbances seem to be the main thing benefits that uh, older adults can gain from cannabis. Uh, the understanding we have now about pain is, as as the as as we've been noted, is that there is certainly acute pain and and chronic pain. And when things become to the point of chronic pain, uh, there are other factors and comorbidities that become part of the whole clinical picture. And that does include sleep disturbance and anxiety. Uh, people don't want to, they believe that uh, more activity they do and it will hurt their tissue. So they, the less they do, they get less exercise, they get deconditioned. Uh, they don't do as many of the fun things they used to do. And it just sets up this ongoing cycle. Um, what cannabis is able to do is to go and impact on those comorbidities and once people have a better sense that they have better control of their pain, they're more prone to going out to working in the garden, more prone to taking walks, more uh, social interactions. They have, and of course, a better sleep, all, all a better night's sleep always imparts to a better day the next day. So that's a, a very important uh, part of where medical cannabis fits in. Um, I also say that when it comes to arthritis, um, we all were invincible at some point in time and probably did a lot of things on the edge. So I, so many of my patients are having the results of uh, too many too, too many times uh, on snowboards, uh, skiing, uh, high school football, and uh, out west here, I've even had a handful of people uh, doing rodeo, uh, rodeo circuit and uh, mixed martial arts. Uh, it takes its toll, and certainly the as part of the cannabis part of the of the um, of the presentation is inflammation. Well, through the CB2 receptors on the immune system, the cannabis is actually able to help improve and reduce uh, uh, the inflammation and uh, th uh, through uh, impacting on the uh, COX uh, enzymes. Um, and, you, and again, benefits can be had from a topical and uh, from oral form with arthritis. The people will use, oftentimes use topical, again, as adjunct uh, to what they're using, inhaling and ingesting. And as I also mentioned, you know, sleep is also an important part of uh, getting good, good, good benefit. Uh, sleep is restorative. Um, it improves your health, uh, healing, quality of life. Uh, by modulating the inflammation, uh, promotes uh, good sleep, and and if you able and and opioids have been noted to actually cause uh, um, uh, sleep disturbances. I did find a, a lot of the studies for sleep are relatively small, uh, but I did find a study from two thousand seven where they studied uh, over two thousand patients, and this is the people using a THC and CBD combination of cannabis. And it was placebo controlled, and 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 there were mark uh, there were many different many different medical conditions were part of this cohort. 
Uh, there was marked improvement uh, in the sleep parameters uh, for for the patients, and actually this this benefit uh, persisted uh, long term without needing to adjust uh, or increase the uh, medical cannabis dosing. It's also been, I think it was part of the question that, uh, that was submitted, I might as well answer it now. Yes, uh, there have been studies on patients with dementia that have improved sleep patterns with a low dose THC. And certainly trauma-related uh, sleep disturbances, uh, PTSD are also being noted uh, to be improved on a regular basis. With regards to uh, cannabis and mood, some people uh, find that cannabis can alleviate their anxiety and depressive symptoms, but for other people, it can worsen these conditions. Uh, and this is more likely at very high doses of cannabis or for people who do not metabolize THC well. So a study came out a few years ago that found that CBD was most effective in treating anxiety, most specifically the consumption of the plant itself or whole plant cannabis, which I will discuss later. Uh, however, they found that uh, with THC at very high doses tended to an elicit an anxiogenic response or to increase anxiety. Um, so there's no real randomized controlled trials that have examined the efficacy of cannabis in treating anxiety. And so in this case, the patient themselves is their own study. Here are some other medical conditions for which cannabis has been demonstrated to confer clinical benefit. I saw there was a question in the chat about neuropathy. Neuropathy would be included on this list as well. We can talk about that a little bit later in more detail. Uh, epilepsy actually has an FDA approved therapy called Epidolex. Uh, specifically regarding COVID, it has been found that acidic cannabinoids, which I will discuss more in detail later, have been shown to have micromolar affinity for the spike protein on the COVID viral particle, which may prevent entry of live COVID virus into cells. Uh, there was a recent study that showed that intubated COVID-19 patients that smoked cannabis actually did better than those that didn't. And it's believed because of the cannabinoid receptors on the immune cells in the lungs activated those immune cells and thereby minimized the inflammatory storm from the COVID infection. So I would say that that probably works a lot better than bleach, wouldn't you say? Um, if you Google cannabis use in older adults, this is the first article that pops up in the search. This was a very large systematic review of a variety of studies of cannabis use in older adults. And the conclusion of the study was this. For medical cannabis, harmful associations outnumbered beneficial. Cannabis use was associated with greater frequencies of depression, anxiety, cognitive impairment, problematic substance use, accidents, injuries, and acute healthcare use. Right after they said that conclusion, they said, studies were often small, did not consistently assess harms and did not adjust for confounding. So basically they came to certain conclusions, but then in the same breath implied that the research they based their study on does not meet the standards that are needed to believably make those conclusions. Uh, this review was based on a mix of studies that did not distinguish between recreational and medical users. And that, that is uh, a must, uh, they must be separated for valid scientific study. So this article was by far too wide ranging with too many variables and study parameters. So if anyone tries to show you this article to negate the value of medical cannabis, you can safely tell them that the conclusions it made are faulty. Hmm. You wanna comment, Dad? Uh, no, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I'll also point out that the majority of studies that talk about the negative effects of cannabis focus on people who are smoking or vaping cannabis, uh, which is typically more seen in recreational users. And many med medical cannabis patients used or oral and topical formulations. This is a good time to distinguish between recreational and medical cannabis. So the amount of THC in cannabis has increased over time and is now much higher uh, in much higher concentrations. So the cannabis out there now is not your average Woodstock strain cannabis. Uh, so when we talk about recreational cannabis, it's important to note that we do not have medical guidelines in place uh, for it the way that we have for alcohol. So for alcohol, our guidelines recommend no more than one standard drink for women daily and no more than two standard drinks for men daily, uh, but we do not have such guidelines for recreational cannabis. 
So I wanna talk about some of the uh, potential drug interactions with cannabis. So these are some of the medications that have been identified to have potential interactions with cannabis. This is just based on my initial review of the literature and is not an exhaustive list. It's important to note here that much of this is based on speculation uh, because of the way that cannabis is metabolized in the body and the way that many of these medications are metabolized in the body. So they describe them as potential interactions because cannabis can theoretically enhance or inhibit the metabolism of a particular medication, which may either decrease or increase the effects of the medicine uh, in the body and vice versa. So I wanna talk specifically about opioids for a moment. Using opioids does not automatically preclude cannabis use. They may have a synergistic analgesia that helps to avoid tolerance to opioids and the need for opioid dose escalation. So it basically widens the therapeutic window of opioids. So for example, there has been some evidence uh, that cannabis upregulates opioid receptor proteins in the spinal cord. Uh, Cardiorespiratory suppression is a concerning side effect of opioids, but there's no real evidence that cannabis use increases this risk. Uh, regarding some of the other meds on this list, Fluoxetine and amiodarone may increase exposure uh, to THC in the receptors and thereby increase its psychoactive effects. Uh, Ketoconazole, which is an antifungal, uh, may also increase THC and CBD concentrations in the body. Uh, smoked cannabis can increase the clearance of theophylline, which is a popular COPD medication, by up to 40% and can thereby reduce its efficacy. With statins specifically, it's possible that CBD can affect the metabolism of simvastatin and atorvastatin and thereby increase their concentrations in the blood. But this is not a concern with pravastatin or rosuvastatin because they are metabolized differently. Uh, the one that I want people to be most mindful of is warfarin because cannabis may increase warfarin levels, which thereby increases uh, the risk of bleeding. Um, do you want to comment? Well, yeah, I'm going to say, you know, there's always been this concern about uh, opiates uh, and cannabis being uh, used to, together. Uh, well, I can point out one thing that why uh, there is no respiratory uh, suppression node with cannabis is because there are no CB uh, cannabinoid receptors in the respiratory centers of the brainstem. So that being said, I do remember there being a, a study that was performed in Israel where uh, patients uh, with chronic pain were on a, a, a opiate regimen, and then a standard dose of cannabis was added to their daily regimen, and the patients were allowed to adjust their as-needed use of opiates accordingly. So over the course of one to two months, it was demonstrated that the patients on their own seem to reduce their opioid use anywhere from 40 to 80 percent, and in some cases seemingly got totally off the opioids. And, you know, and that tends to suggest that there's, you know, a synergistic uh, benefit to be had uh, between opiates and cannabis. There was not any increase in the circulating opioids that was demonstrated. And certainly there's less side effects uh, associated with the opiates when you get, have a lower dose or reduce that completely. Uh, as far as that exhaustive list, I have had several patients on some combinations of many of these medications. I cannot cite there's any evidence, uh, clinical evidence that there's been some major alteration in the uh, cannabis uh, levels or the other levels of the prescribed drugs. If anything, you know, certainly uh, as older uh, adults, we have different metabolisms, but people will tend to adjust their dosing accordingly uh, to get the desired effect and avoid side effects. Uh, I, uh, in my practice of cardiology, had to use warfarin, and warfarin interacts with everything. So, uh, so oftentimes, once people find a good uh, dosing of cannabis that seems to work for them, uh, seems to get good uh, absorption, uh, they tend to stick with that same dose uh, and, and, uh, going forward. So now I'd like to address some of these potential side effects of cannabis. I think this is of interest to people. Um, you know, particularly as it pertains to psychoactive 
forms of cannabis or those that contain more THC, they can alter one's sensorium. So it is important to be mindful of those potential side effects. Uh, with specific, specifically to dry mouth, the reason that cannabis can cause dry mouth is because there's a CB receptor mediated effect of THC on the salivary glands, which reduces salivary flow. Uh, and pulmonary symptoms of cannabis tend to be seen in people that either smoke or vape uh, their cannabis. And again, um, uh, just and I'll come back to this in a moment, but some of the more potential, potentially um, more serious consequences of cannabis use, one of them is cannabis hypolemesis syndrome, which is a condition in which people who consume very large and very strong doses of cannabis over time uh, develop recurrent vomiting. Um, there is a potential for addiction to cannabis uh, in people that have a tendency towards addictive behaviors. But my understanding is that this risk is actually a little bit overblown. Um, it's important to note that all of these side effects, these potential adverse effects and potential side effects of cannabis uh, tend to happen at very high and very frequent doses of the psychoactive forms of cannabis. Any comment, Dad? Uh, no, falls uh, appear to be one of the most uh, concern concerning thing as people will tend to be, you know, have dizziness and and falls and associated, you know, maybe they have more problems with their arthritis. So those are things that help help each individual uh, adjust their dose. They have to feel like they're not having too much of an effect, but getting enough of a pain relief to become more functional. This is very important, uh, and this is a really this is a very important part of the talk, and I'd like for everyone to pay close attention. It is important to note that some of the medicinal components of cannabis are diminished or lost through smoking or vaporizing, and the reason for this is decarboxylation. When phytocannabinoids are heated up to a particular temperature, which we understand to be 240 degrees Fahrenheit, they lose a carbon group from their molecules. Um, and so in their natural form, without being heated up, the phytocannabinoids are in an acidic form, um, hence why these are referred to as THCA, CBD, CBDA, and the like. So these acidic cannabinoids have greater bioavailability than the neutral cannabinoids without the psychoactive effects and have very significant medicinal effects. Uh, in their original acidic form, without heating, uh, the cannabinoids are more effective in treating inflammation and pain than their neutral counterparts. So for example, THCA has been shown to have anti-inflammatory, anti-seizure, and anti-nausea effects at much lower doses than the neutral form of psychoactive form of THC. CBDA, is absorbed five to 11 times better than neutral CBD when taken orally and is more potent. It has been shown to target the COX enzymes. COX enzymes are associated with inflammation, and this is the same mechanism through which NSAIDs, such as ibuprofen, help to reduce in, uh, inflammation. Uh, and as I had mentioned, CBGA plays a major role in the formation of other uh, cannabinoids. Yeah. And so a very easy way to go and get your dose of uh, the acidic cannabinoids is to take some flour material, uh, put it in a mug, pour in some hot water, and let it seep for three to five minutes. And this, since uh, the acidic cannabinoids are hydrophilic, they will easily uh, be uh, come out into the hot water, and then uh, you can just drink the whole thing uh, down. Um, there's no need to add any milk or butter. Um, and again, it's it's better, both THCA and CBDA are, are, more, are better absorbed and hence will likely have a more beneficial effect. Um, I, I will say that before, and again, the whole findings of the, of the acid cannabinoids are because those chemistry majors we used to make fun of are now know how to extract them. But I will say I had a number of patients uh, before this came out where among the ways I asked how they were using their cannabis, they say they were making a tea. And I was like, okay, well, now we know. Um, so, uh, and, and I also say also that another way people will use the, if you will, raw cannabis uh, is to make smoothies. 
uh, uh, shakes or smoothies. Uh, I do have one particular uh, mother who was treating her autistic child, uh, a teenager, if you will, um, with a, 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 a smoothie, a cannabis smoothie uh, twice a day. And certainly uh, she couldn't send him to school, you know, altered. But within three weeks, you know, she, she went up and just asked him, how are you feeling? And he said, mom, I, I feel like a human being. And uh, so there's a lot of good benefits to be had from the acidic cannabinoids. So this is just a general example of dosage recommendations of plant-based acidic cannabinoids. The dosing range of the cannabinoids is quite large, 0 0.05 to 25 milligrams per kilogram per day. So it's a quite wide range um, and very so it requires very individualized doses. So it's important to start with a low dose and adjust accordingly uh, based on your own uh, reaction. Um, so... Some people, as we mentioned, will choose to put this in a tea. Um, some people choose to chew the raw flower or even just hold it inside their buccal mucosa. Um, so um, it's important though, to make sure that you're getting any and all cannabis products from a reputable supplier and that they are lab tested to ensure quality and purity. You know, some cannabis flower can have aspergillus or other types of fungi. So if you are immunocompromised or immunosuppressed, you need to be careful. Um, also, while there are a lot of people in the dispensaries that are quite knowledgeable, we recommend that you consult a reputable medical cannabis provider, a physician, nurse practitioner, or physician assistant to provide you with guidance. And if you see that a provider is not helpful or does not give you adequate guidance, then see someone else because the potential for benefit and the potential for harm are both formidable here. So it's best to leave it to uh, the licensed experts. Any comment, Dad? Uh, uh, no, well, people have to go and start somewhere. And again, as mentioned before, you know, start low and go slow. Uh, the one thing about gummies is that they're now consistently made at the at specified uh, uh, concentrations and combinations. So once people can find you know a, a good dose, they will tend to stick with it. Everybody is different, so I, when I can never tell anybody, well, how much should I use? Starting starting on a low dose and assessing the benefit, and then adjusting oh, accordingly is the way to go. Uh, the inhalation forms do give rapid onset, which can be very important in people with their migraines um, and also with uh, 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 onset of nausea. But generally, uh, uh, edible forms, uh, they tend to take anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes to actually start to have a measurable impact. Um, so, Dr. Hedman, I think we're we're we really need to leave some time for questions. Okay. So we're um, almost done. I have one. Go ahead. Yeah, I just have a couple very important. Um, uh, go ahead. Through that, we'll likely answer some questions that people have. Okay. Um, so this was just an example of um, like um, uh, a plan for uh, uh, for cannabis titration. Uh, so they do recommend that people um, use keep a product and dose log uh, to help you find the right dose and schedule. Uh, some of you are probably wondering how you can even go about doing this in the state of Massachusetts. First, you would visit a certifying healthcare provider to get a written recommendation, and then you would enroll in the Massachusetts Medical Use of Marijuana Program. Looks like the state of Massachusetts has not caught up about the use of the term marijuana, so hopefully they'll uh, get with the program soon. Uh, you have to be a legal resident with an ID. Uh, you may have to show a utility bill to confirm your residence. This is a list of conditions, but also not an exhaustive list. It is at the discretion of the provider that is supporting your application. Um, and then once you have the card, you would be able to avoid paying taxes on any cannabis that you purchase, which, which can be up to 20%. Some people will qualify for a hardship cultivation reg registration, which allows you to legally grow your, grow your own cannabis if you have financial hardship, you don't have access to reliable transportation, or you live far away from a designated uh, medical cannabis treatment center. Uh, this is a uh, integrative medicine doctor. It's great. He specializes in geriatrics, integrative medicine, and he is uh, one of our go-to medical cannabis um, 
uh, physicians here uh, in Mass General. I just recently met him at his office in Salem. Uh, him and his NP, Megan Clements, are lovely. They have a very nice clinic space. Uh, they're getting ready to launch group visits in a test kitchen. Um, I understand Salem is a bit far for people, so uh, they may have some virtual options. Um, but this is one person that you can connect with um, if you're interested in finding out more about how to use medical cannabis to treat your specific health conditions. Um, and uh, also the healer.com and Society for Cannabis Clinicians websites are also great resources. Um, so we'll move on to uh, questions. I just wanted to, um, you know, just uh, give my dad the floor with any last minute uh, points here. You know, uh, just trying to get more education for both clinicians to get people to get them to start to teach the endocannabinoid system uh, in medical schools and to be able to uh, have more research, more evidence-based research. So could clinicians and patients would feel more comfortable, you know, using cannabis for their medical uh, disorders. Step number one would be removing the schedule one designation, and that would open up a lot of opportunity here. So thank you so much. This was incredibly informative. Um, and so I feel like I'm much better prepared and more knowledgeable. So thank you. A lot of the questions that came in before today's presentation, I think you all have touched on, but there are a couple. One, for example, that just came in. Can you say a little bit about the difference between medical cannabis and recreational cannabis. And my understanding is that's really, it's not so much the difference in the cannabis, it's the difference in why you're using it and how you can access it. But could you maybe say a little bit about that? Uh, certainly. Um, I have to say that the vast majority of my patients really don't like to get high. Uh, and I, before there was CBD as alternatives, I have had patients that would drive in from the coast which is about an hour out of Portland, uh, and they will purposely not use any cannabis to before they got behind the wheel of a car, and then they would have to drive back. Um, so rec recreational is wanting is just pretty much mostly mostly using uh, inhaled forms of cannabis, and uh, generally uh, medicinal forms tend to offer the longer acting effect that people need for to get through their day and to get through their night. Okay, thank you. Um, can you say something about the best form of cannabis gummies for sleep? Do you have uh, any recommendations about that? Um, if okay. Uh, if one were to go and try and you start to use the dummy I, gummy, I would try to find the lowest dose gummy that you can find, preferably CBD, uh, or if you want to, or or a CBD THC combination. If you were to go and get like a ten milligram uh, gummy, I would almost suggest starting with a quarter of a gummy, and see how that affects you and your sleep at night. Uh, do that for you know a few nights, and if you're not feeling any adverse effects, then you can start, but not getting as much sleep as you'd like, and I'd certainly increase it accordingly to a half, three quarters, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Does prescription insurance cover um, any of these forms of cannabis or the visits to um, learn about how to use it and whether it might be effective for you? Um, certainly, it's not being covered by medical insurance. So people whom are using medical cannabis are having to pay, you know, out of pocket. But then again, they're getting the relief. And even though their prescription medications were well covered by insurance, they don't work or they cause too much side effects. So you need to have your quality of life and you and cannabis offers that to uh, many patients. Um, and the other part of the question was um, for the visit. If you go to see somebody, um, a medical cannabis provider, uh, does insurance cover those visits? You know, I'm going to say that, for instance, if you go to a licensed doctor, uh, and I, 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 it may very well depend on the insurance company. I have had a few people who have attempted to go and get reimbursement from their insurance company for their visits to me. I don't know okay. how successful they were. Okay. 
Um, can you say another question that came in? And I think I'm going to expand it a little bit, but the question was about what are the effects on cognition? And the, the way I'm going to expand that is that I think there are effects on cognition in the short term, but are there also long-term effects on cognition? Uh, yeah, cognition effects are indeed a, a potential uh, issue. Um, I will say that there was a study study that was uh, trying to uh, determine the negative cognitive effects seen on a young adult's brain. This has been the in a study, and the study it was a meta-analysis, meta and what they determined uh, was that yes. Under the acute phase of using the cannabis, there was cognitive uh, changes. Once the cannabis was stopped, the, ca the cognitive uh, anomaly resolved. So no, there does not appear to be any long-term, you know, this was just trying to answer the whole concern that, you know, teenagers were frying their brains. Well, I, no, no I, not, not so much. Okay. Okay. And I, I know you mentioned this, but I'm going to ask it again. Um, given that sometimes I feel like we should probably just put statins in the water, um, given how common they are used. Can you say a little bit? My understanding is what you said is that if you're on a statin, certain kinds of statins, it could increase their efficacy, if you will. But so maybe you need to, I don't know, I'm going to let you answer, but that's how I understood what you said. So, so basically, you know, so a torvastatin and simvastatin are metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system. And that is how they're metabolized in the body. There is some evidence that cannabis um, can, it can be an inducer of, um, or, or excuse me, an inhibitor of that system. And so um, if it inhibits that cytochrome system, then it may potentially decrease the ability of the body to metabolize and process the statin drug, which okay. may theoretically increase the level of the statin in the body. Okay. And again, again, this is all theoretical based on what we know about how these drugs are metabolized in the body. Okay. But Fravastatin I'm, and Rosuvastatin are not processed the same way in the body, are not metabolized the same way. Okay. Could I ask you to stop screen sharing so we can see yeah. you better? Um, we're almost out of time. And I'm just, oh, great, great photographs. Thank you. Um, I'm also going to ask Monique if we can share the slides with everyone, um, because I think there was so much helpful information. It would be good for people to have these to refer to. Uh, sure, I can, I, I'd be happy to do that. Okay. And also, um, I guess we've got time for one last question with a short answer, but it's not necessarily a short answer. But if you could just mention some of the contraindications um, that um, people might want to be aware of, and they specifically asked about antidepressants. So again, it's, it's similar. Um, you know, some of these things are working on the same receptors. And so you know, your, your antidepressants such as uh, SSRIs work on serotonin receptors, and then can, uh, cannabis may also interact with serotonin receptors. Um, and then there's also a question about whether or not uh, the cannabis is um, affecting the metabolism of those, of those medications. And so again, it doesn't necessarily, like it, you wanna talk to both, like if you're being prescribed these medications, you wanna talk to both your primary doctor and your medical cannabis specialist doctor and get input from both of them to determine if it is safe um, to use both and how much to use. So for example, um, you know, if you're, you, you wanna start with a very low dose, you know, and, and let me just also preface this by saying, a lot of doctors will just say, no, don't do it. Absolutely not, just because they don't have the information about how these things can potentially still be used together. Uh, yeah. Because of the lack of education in medical schools, it's just been like a, a knee-jerk reaction to just poo-poo all of this. Um, and our our goal is to kind of like break the mold with that and explain that there is a role. Uh, if we have endogenous cannabinoids in our body, then clearly there is a role 
for the use of phytocannabinoids. Um, and it just has to be done very carefully in concert with multiple specialists to make sure that your safety as a patient is uh, optimized. Yes, thank you. I think that's a very important statement. Um, Dr. Hedman, I'm going to, Dr. Sean Hedman, I'm going to give you the closing remarks because we're really out of time. Well, again, as Monique said, there's no evidence that shows that there's any counterindications to using uh, antidepressants. Um, as I as I said, I've uh, really had quite quite it's been quite an interesting journey and education for me. I've had to go and relearn internal medicine as well as orthopedic surgery and uh, then some neurology. So uh, to see how much how how much benefit so many of my patients have gotten over the years, it just astounds me. Uh, and just again, how much it has just made a significant difference in their quality of life and their ability to just, you know, it be more functional. So uh, as soon as we can get rid of the stigma, stigma get more evidence, evidence-based medicine, uh, many people will be, will get great benefit, great, right? Yeah. Well, thank you so much. You're getting a lot of positive feedback in the chat. So I hope you take a look. And I want to thank everyone who attended today. And we'll do our best to get the slides and other information out to people. Um, and I also just want to mention quickly that I think that there are two primary care doctors at Mass General that also um, are very knowledgeable about cannabis Dr. Peter Grinspoon, G-R-I-N-S-P-O-O-N, and Dr. Mark Eisenberg. I'm not sure. I think Dr. Eisenberg is no longer seeing patients, but they're both based at our Charlestown Health Center in Charlestown. So thank you so much. I hope everybody stays well, especially with the current rise. So be safe. Um, take all the precautions that we now are second nature to most of us. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all for listening and attending. Thank you. Thank all you. right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.